Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about a reckoning with immigration policy. Reform has been long in coming. Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Welcome to the show, Gene. So this is um, interesting because um, borders um, sort of define um, the global community. And um, we have border issues of major magnitude here in the United States. And there are growing border issues elsewhere. And we should talk about how borders have changed and how the concept of borders have changed in a time when the world seems to be, well, I say, moving right. Yeah. So um, what is going on in the global south? Will that continue? Will it get worse? The Monroe Doctrine of 1823, you know, uh, undertook not only um, a strong American presence in Latin America, implicitly the Monroe Doctrine said we would be helpful to Latin America. Have we been? We've made mistakes over the years since 1823. And what can we do about it now? Don't we need the labor force involved in immigration? Singapore um, asks for millions of people to come in and round out their labor force. Why don't we do that? Are we doing it? And there was an article in the paper today about how there are very few people who actually legally become citizens. Uh, so where are we on this? Don't we need some work on it? Would, would a wall work? Would, would Trump's wall ever work? And Congress has done nothing. What kind of reform should Congress adopt? And we should also take a look at other places in the world where the global South migrates um, because of geopolitical factors and also because of climate change, as in Africa and the Middle East, um, to go north. And when they do, that can be very disruptive. So, Gene, this is a pretty big subject. You spent time in the global South. Can you tell us you know, the problem in Latin America. Can you tell us what is going on there that makes people line up to try to get into the southern border of the United States? Well, there's a mix of factors. Uh, by far and away, the country sends us, that sends most people to the United States as immigrants uh, is Mexico, our next door neighbor. And, um, as you know, the American Southwest was at one point part of Mexico. And in 1848, we fought a war uh, <clears throat> against uh, uh, that and, and received uh, California, that big area of California as a state, and later with the Gadsden Purchase, New Mexico and Arizona. So there is a strong Latino heritage in the Southwest of the United States. And part of that heritage is the movement back and forth of people uh, in an economic and um, reciprocal way. There are definitely villages in Mexico that for maybe 100 years or more have been sending people to California and the Southwest to harvest crops. California is the largest agricultural producer in the United States of all the states. We think more of the heartland of uh, Kansas and Nebraska, but it's really California and the Great Central Valley. And without the Mexican workers, the Bracero programs from 1942 to 1964, we wouldn't be able to harvest our crops. So there's been a reciprocal arrangement. Now, since the late 19, uh, or uh, 1980s and early 1990s, uh, there has been a huge change in our attitude toward immigration and the border, particularly in the Southwest from Texas through California. And that is largely due to politics. What we're hearing today about the so-called immigration problem is largely politics. Yes, there are people from other countries who are trying to come over illegally uh, over our southern border, but mostly it's Latin America. And our relationship with Latin America has been one of benign neglect and sometimes not so benign neglect. We have fought wars uh, with Mexico, as you know, uh, and of course the Spanish-American War uh, with Spain. 
Um, so our, our attitude toward Latin America is sort of like the Colossus of the North. That's what they call us, the Colossus mm -hmm. of the North. And uh, we haven't been so kind. Uh, on the other hand, the Monroe Doctrine was intended to protect our hemisphere from foreign imperialism. Uh, Napoleon uh, came in at one point and was and was ruling Mexico. So that was French. And we've had uh, British colonialism in the Guianas. And we've had Portuguese colonialism in Brazil. So the whole attitude of the founders was stay away from our shores. We don't want any foreign countries here. Let us develop our own um, our own countries. And we've taken this attitude toward Latin America. But Latin America has been beset with major problems. Um, they've never overcome, in most places, they've never overcome the problem of, of poverty, inequality, authoritarianism, the so-called man on the white horse who comes in and stages a coup and then rules for a while and then the army overthrows him and so forth and so on. That is not to say that there aren't major countries in Latin America. Mexico is looked up to uh, by C Central Americans. It is uh, the metropole that, that the Central America looks to uh, for advancement and for uh, imitation. And then of course you have Brazil, which is definitely part of the global South, but is also a major player in the world today. Chile, which has a, a nice relationship actually with California over the years. Uh, Argentina, which is uh, uh, Buenos Aires is considered the Paris of Latin America. I've traveled in Latin America, I've lived in Central America, and each country is distinct, different, has its own history and culture, and it is delightful in many cases. Well, if it's so delightful, why are so many people trying to leave? and claiming sanctuary? Sometimes because uh, particularly, I would say in the late 20th century and up till today, uh, we have meddled in that part of the world. Uh, there was of course a worldwide push during the time of the Soviet Union to spread communism to other countries, and that includes Latin America. In fact, I was traveling in Ecuador in the 1960s when I uh, ran into a, a man who'd been spending months and months in the Amazon basin. He was an American uh, special forces soldier who was there. We were there, I learned from this, to counter uh, Cubans who were coming into the Amazon region to try and influence uh, governments in, in South America. So there has been this infiltration of imperialism, uh, basically from the Soviet Union during that time. And in reaction to that, perhaps too strong reaction to that, um, we meddled in Central America in the Salvadoran Civil War, which took place between the late 1970s and the early 1990s. And this completely upended uh, the situation in that country where there, it was just a dreadful war. And I, I know personally of children who were being kidnapped by both sides to be conscripted into the armies. They would conscript child soldiers. Under those conditions, you can understand why people were fleeing the country. More lately, we've had the rise of the drug trade in Mexico, which I suspect, and most people do, that uh, China is uh, importing or exporting uh, the materials for fentanyl to be developed in Mexico and to destabilize the United States and demoralize our population. So we've had the drug cartels. Before that, we had the problems for years and years in Colombia, which started out as a civil war with communist, um, communists threatening the traditional government in Colombia back in the 1960s, and then developed into uh, a drug haven for manufacturing drugs. So the, the whole problem with drugs 
uh, has created destabilization. Gangs have taken over in Honduras, for example. We get a lot of people from Honduras coming up to the border. And in fact, when uh, Kamala Harris was given the portfolio to do something <laughs> about this, she wasn't given the portfolio to try and and keep people from coming into the United States at the Texas border because not even the president can do that. She was given the portfolio to go to Central America and she did. And she talked to, to the people in, in the various countries there that have problems, Honduras and Guatemala uh, and El Salvador in particular. Uh, Costa Rica has been very stable. We have met- A lot of Americans retire in Costa Rica. I lived in Costa Rica as a Peace Corps volunteer. It's a delightful country. It's had problems of poverty, but it's very free. And John F. Kennedy um, made friends with their president, who ultimately won the Nobel Prize for Peace. And the United States has a very stable ally in, in Costa Rica. But even Costa Rica has suffered from the drug trade because drugs pass through Costa Rica. And a country that had literally no crime when I lived there um, does have some crime now, but it isn't anywhere near what you find in Mexico or Honduras. Hmm. What are we going to do? By the way, before I forget, you use the word Colossus. Colossus from the north, I think you said. Well, the poem, uh, the Emma Lazarus poem, on the Statue of Liberty, the name of the poem is the New Colossus, 1883. And it begins, everybody knows, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free and so forth. Um, but it's called the New Colossus. Is that the same Colossus that you refer to? No, there are uh, Spanish and Argentinian and Latino authors uh, who have given us the name Colossus of the North uh, on their own. I, I'm sure they're familiar with Emma Lazarus's poem, however, and maybe they were inspired by it. I don't know. But um, mm -hmm. it's not an entirely um, it's not an entirely nice title. I mean, we're looked upon as to a certain <laughs> oppressive. Right. I was in Nicaragua too, and in, in FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, put the Somoza family in control of Nicaragua for decades and decades. I mean, for many, many years. It's now, of course, under the aegis of a local communist, but, but it, it was so incredibly repressive that when we were having um, drinks outside on a patio uh, on a at a cafe, uh, in Tegucigalpa, I was talking to a businessman uh, who was working in Nicaragua. He was, I think, British. And we started talking about politics, and he suddenly lowered his voice, and he said to me, I can't talk about that here. I could get arrested. So it was an extremely repressive government. Oh, my goodness. You know, and one, the one common denominator that occurs to me through all of Latin America it's not only the Spanish influence, or in the case of Brazil, the Portuguese influence. It's the influence of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is everywhere. And yet, these problems exist very nearly everywhere. What effect has the Catholic Church had on trying to make it a better quality of life in Latin America? People don't realize that the Catholic Church is really an interesting organization in that it probably had more charitable agencies working in the world than any other institution on earth for many, many years. Um, traveling in Guatemala on a train, I ran into a Marinol um, devotee. Uh, I think she was a nun, but it was hard to tell. They're very secular. And, and their particular um, Imprimatur is to go out and work with the poor. And she was working with the poor. Uh, I made the mistake of playing Scrabble with her. I consider myself a pretty good Scrabble player, and she cleaned my clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it has some very good people on the ground, the Catholic Church. On the other hand, 
when you get up into the institutional offices of Catholic Church, and by the way, the current Pope is from Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, you get into um, people who have to bishops and archbishops and cardinals who have to interface with the governments, which are sometimes very repressive. And uh, they become compromised. They don't always do what the local parish priests want. And, you know, um, the, the uh, theology uh, embraced in the late 20th century by many of the priests who were working with the impoverished people, um, liberation theology, it was called, was ultimately denounced by the Vatican, even though they were uh, helping the people and but they were also espousing socialist ideology, which was anathema since the church was being oppressed in Eastern Europe by communists. And although socialism and communism are not the same thing, there was, as I said, influences, communist influences in Latin America fostered by uh, the Soviet Union and its international outreach. So the church was sort of on the horns of a dilemma. They want to support the poor. On the other hand, they want to defend the status quo, even though the status quo is authoritarian, that's better than letting it go into a communist rebellion. And of course, there were communist rebellions. That's what, you know, El Salvador was very influenced. Nicaragua was very influenced. Oh, well, we've kind of let it go, haven't we? Since the Monroe Doctrine, which implicitly, um, to me, and I suppose to a lot of people over the last, what, 200 years, um, you know, has, has included a kind of noblesse oblige uh, obligation on the part of the United States. You know, we say we want to be the uh, hegemony of, of Latin America, but, you know, what goes with that is um, to help them out. We really haven't helped them. We haven't done a good job. You know, you describe a situation where there are islands of of quality of life, but there are many islands of drugs, violence, um, really horrible dictator governments, uh, and and people, you know, are having a ter terrible time, and they come north. What and what a trip that is, and so on that side of things, the global south, at least in in this hemisphere, um, you know, has been kind of an abandoned child. And, you know, if, if we had done it right, Gene, I'm, I'm not talking about immigration now. I'm talking about the United States as a noblesse oblige kind of party to the transaction. If we had done it right since the Monroe Doctrine, what would we have done to make Latin America a better place? Well, because we are the number one power and economic powerhouse in the world right now, uh, we tend to forget that for a good deal of our history, we were very weak and we were engaged in conquering a continent for good or ill. And that took a lot of our energy. So our energy was not directed toward protecting or defending uh, the countries to our south under the aegis of the Monroe Doctrine. What we wanted was not to be threatened by them or have any threats come into that hemisphere from foreign countries that we would then have to deal with. I mean, <laughs> we wanted Europe out of our hair for most of our history. And today it's very different, of course. Um, today, we, we take um, an attitude toward Latin America that is very negative and uh, very demeaning. Uh, and you see this in the rhetoric of, the, of Trump about the rapists and the criminals and the uh, child traffickers uh, on our border that are threatening us today, which is, by the way, straight out of uh, the radical white nationalist right of the 1990s and comes out of the origins of the rhetoric you hear in the GOP toward immigrants today, comes right out of the rhetoric that uh, Glenn Spencer used when he formed the first militia on the border 
uh, in around 1992 called the American Border Patrol. He had been active in Los Angeles. I knew about Spencer. He had been active in Los Angeles um, in anti-immigrant activities, anti-proposition uh, 187 in, in California, which would reduce benefits to immigrants and so forth. And he went to the border and he started the whole immigration policy that the, the GOP has today. And he used some of the same rhetoric. He called people by the same names. He talked about drugs and uh, he talks about gangs and he talked about um, they're wanting to come over the border and change our culture, our white culture, and dilute our population, and that the Jews were encouraging them to do this. So this rhetoric is, is traceable back to Glenn Spencer, the American Border Patrol, and then very shortly after, Chris Simcox came in with the Minutemen, and pretty soon you had a bunch of these militias on the border with all their little toys trying to influence the Border Patrol. And since then, people have had this rhetoric has influenced how we think about what's happening on the border. Yeah, and the Border Patrol has been influenced I, under that uh, Trump appointee. What was his name? Wolf. Um, it, you know, the, it, it became pretty much a, a, a politicized and, and adopted the same a kind of attitude toward people on the other side of the border. You know, what, what is ironic about this, Gene, is that after undertaking, you know, the notion of the Monroe Doctrine, we didn't do it right. Maybe we were busy. Uh, we, we had manifest destiny to, to accomplish. Um, we had some wars, foreign wars to deal with, but we really didn't do it right. And then, and then in the 20th century, we started doing it ever so wrong. We started developing this this uh, isolationist uh, attitude toward anybody at the south of the border. Even though it was our fault that a lot of those countries were in dire straits, economically, socially, politically, and it got worse. And then you know you get Trump, who accentuates the whole problem. He doesn't do anything to help them at all. Close down our relationship with uh, Cuba. I I was always wondering about why he did that. Um, and uh, makes uh, demands and threats uh, on Mexico um, and doesn't take care of any place in Latin America. At the same time, he wants to build a wall. What kind of policy is that? That's terrible policy. That What that does is it, it, it ironically dumps on Latin America, but it also ironically recognizes and mm, accentuates the politicization of the southern border. Is this worthy policy going forward? What is the end of the road on this? If we have a wall, uh, whether it be a physical wall or a legal wall that keeps everybody out on the southern border, where does that take the continent? Well, if your attitude is that America is in decline, and the reason why it is in decline is because all of the nine white people that are uh, creating a demographic crisis for the white race, and that a large part of this is due to the immigrant population and the illegals on the border, um, then you understand that you have to have a target of opportunity. Every authoritarian philosophy needs a scapegoat. They will define and defend those that are acceptable, the acceptable population, which in this case is traditional uh, American and probably <laughs> European, because that's what Trump is, um, individuals <laughs> of European descent. And you, you need a target of opportunity. Uh, if you're gonna run for president, you can't necessarily be overtly uh, anti-Black. Um, and pro-slavery because it doesn't work for votes. Um, so what population are you going to target? Well, you have this huge population that's pressing on our borders, seeking to um, escape oppression, gangs, uh, drugs, uh, poverty, 
um, injustice at our border. And they're, they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they're part of this uh, group to our south that's not supposed to be a problem for us. They're supposed to go and develop their own countries and leave us alone and, um, and, and, you know, and become little Americas on their own. Leave us uh, <laughs> alone so that they can make friends with uh, the Chinese and the Russians, which in many places they have done. Uh, for the lack of an alternative of making friends with with the U.S. But, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, for a while, maybe hundreds of years, um, California and those states near the border, but now in the United States, were part of Mexico. Um, they were Latino. And there's still, you know, enormous number, millions of Latinos in those states right now today. And some of those people, maybe many of them, support Trump for reasons I don't understand. Maybe you understand that. But, you know, we have a substantial, I think it's something close to 20% of our entire population is Latino. And yet <clears throat> they don't want people to come in from the global South either. Why is that? What is the social psychology where one group... Um, you know, uh, opposes the entry of the same group, just a different generation, a different origin, but they're from the same place. I'm from the same place as my relatives in Europe, but I don't feel like I'm part of their culture or their country either. You know, I have pride for uh, the culture that I've inherited. You know, I, I, I eat their food. Uh, I like their food. And, and so forth but that doesn't mean that i'm not thoroughly american and you know the the third oldest town little town in california is um is a, a town that has had the same families in it for over a hundred years and they're largely of mexican descent so the first californians were californios uh, that John C. Fremont uh, depended on to actually win uh, the Mexican War. And, and after he won it, and he had an agreement with them to help let them keep their land, uh, the gold rush happened and they lost their land. So some of the oldest families, and certainly the place names in California, are Mexican. They are, in a sense, our founding fathers, and you had uh, you had Spanish come up the Rio Grande Valley in the 1500s and found New Mexico. Well, golly, that they've been there as long as the Pilgrims were in New England. It's just that, from the perspective of the Eastern United States, uh, they don't recognize that the founding of the Southwest is a different founding and it is largely due to the Spanish and the, the Latino population. So these are people who are also, many of them in Mexico are mestizo, meaning they have large Indian heritage. And of course there were no borders when the Indians uh, lived in uh, the Southwest. And we have Chaco Canyon and places like that, which go way, way back and probably relate even to the Aztec civilization. Then you have the issue in the Latino population in the United States today. And in addition to being American and looking upon immigrants with the same mindset that other Americans do, are they coming here to take our jobs or are they here to help us um, with our businesses and be our laborers? You see, they have the same attitude. You have a tremendous diversity of opinion within the Latino population today, depending partly on where they come from. The Cubans, Cubanos, they think differently from the Mexicanos. So um, they have different issues going on. They're treated differently. So it's not a uh, homogeneous population. And finally, what I will say is there has been tremendous inroads to the Catholic faith among uh, Latino populations in their home countries and here. There have been um, new mega congregations that are um, 
very tuned in to the population in the MAGA base. Um, Trump has a very good relationship with uh, some of the new ap apostolic reformation uh, groups that are largely Latino, some of the Dominionist groups that are Latino, and he uh, cultivates them. So there are some who, because of their religion, are oriented uh, against immigrants because that's what the MAGA policy is. So tragic. We'll have to have another show on on the same, you know, the parallel uh, coming from the Middle East and North Africa uh, into Europe and what, what has happened, what is now playing out in the UK um, on, in terms of trying to keep uh, immigrants out. And hey, Trump is talking about deporting a million people. That's an interesting project for a given afternoon. Uh, I wonder whether that will ever happen, whether he can be serious, whether Vance can be serious. But what I get out of this, Gene, is that a lot of people in this country, both sides of, of the aisle, um, really want to protect the southern border. Uh, they don't think of the Monroe Doctrine. They don't They don't think of noblesse oblige. Uh, they don't care. They, you know, It's the problem of these various countries to take care of their own people. And if they fail, too bad for them. Uh, that's 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 very right wing as far as I'm concerned, but but here we have um, an election where Trump, of course, is arguing that uh, Hannibal Lecter and the people that were in the insane asylums are crossing the border. The the murderers, the rapists, the worst sort of human monsters are coming across the border, and many people believe him when he does that. Um, and then we you know we have uh, his failed policy over the wall. He didn't do anything to reform immigration laws, um, except maybe put children in cages. He did that. Um, and he he hardened uh, Homeland Security and Wolf during his time. But we have we have Kamala. She's got to find a policy that works for largely a similar or the same constituency of people who don't want to see violations of the southern border. Um, and so there's a, almost like a competition for who can come up with a better argument uh, in terms of the platform points of this election. Now, I, I believe in Kamala. I believe she's much more humane. And her you know, position on this, her policy on this, will be much, much more humane. Um, but the point is that both of them are out and about to try to find a way um, to avoid having a, a porous border. A friend of mine worked for the House Immigration Committee for uh, mostly a lifetime. He was a lawyer. And uh, his job was to write legislation that would reform immigration in this country. And he spent 20, 30 years uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives writing or trying to write legislation that would reform immigration. But they didn't do anything. Congress has not seen fit to do anything. So what you have is a, a divisiveness that has existed for a long time about what we do with immigration and the southern border. You know, I, I find it remarkable that um, nobody actually has taken leadership on making this right. And I remember, too, and I'll stop in a minute, Gene. I remember, too, once there was an issue about does the immigration service know who's in the country. Here we are, one of the great database powers in the world with AI and everything else. And their answer was, we don't know who's in the country. We cannot give you a list of who's in the country, legally or illegally. We really don't know. <clears throat> and how can you possibly develop good policy, good immigration reform, if you don't know, you really don't know the demographics? We know it only in the broadest possible terms. We have miles to go before we solve this problem. What are your thoughts about how we solve this problem? Well, there's uh, two sides to the problem. One is building a wall and keeping people out. Uh, the other is to uh, do something about the not very great system of letting people in. I mean, we can absorb a lot of people, and we do need 
immigrants. We are a nation of immigrants. We've always absorbed immigrants. This is one of the great lies that needs to be exposed. And I hope Kamala Harris does something toward it, although it's political dynamite to say that today. But we actually need these people. And we can use them. Our birth rate's going down. So what if they're brown? I mean, that's the big objection on the other side, right? Um, they will come in. They will be Americans, just like the Californios are Americans. Americans. Kamala Harris is from California. She understands us a little bit better than people from the East Coast in terms of what is really going on and has been going on for years and years. The thing is, we have programs like TPS, uh, Temporary Protected Status. That means these people are eligible because um, for uh, temporary uh, status in the United States, they don't have to be given uh, asylum necessarily. They can be admitted on TPS, which means they have a renewable card uh, to be here, live here, and work here as long as the condition in their countries is so bad that they can't go back. They don't have to prove that they personally are persecuted even. Most people don't know about that. And we have a, a, a lot of, we have over 800,000 people in the country today that are under TPS. We have asylum rules where we can increase the number of personnel to admit people for asylum who actually deserve asylum. And yes, we can keep a database on them. Once people come through uh, on, on these processes, even if they appear at the border and they haven't been invited prior to that time, we can keep a database on them. That's not a problem. The Biden administration has already reduced the amount of time it takes to get a green card. They've, re they've cut it in half. Trump increased it. Now, yes, we had COVID and we didn't have an opportunity to admit a lot of people during that time. But prior to that, uh, he had reduced the number of people being processed who deserved uh, the, the opportunity to go through these processes. So we could be devoting a lot more resources to admitting people who deserve to be admitted. And we're just not doing a very good job of it. And we don't need legislation to do that. We do have already programs that exist. And that's one way to admit more people carefully. And obviously, the majority, the very, very large majority of these people are not child traffickers and, and rapists and criminals and in people that they've released from the insane asylums in Venezuela. That is all rhetoric, propaganda designed to create a scapegoat that suits the MAGA authoritarian philosophy. We have to care about our fellow human beings. We can't open the border wide, but we have to care. We have to try to make life better for them. Well, there's much to discuss here, Gene. But I'm left with an interesting thought that you'll appreciate. When Trump repeatedly, and there's an article in today's paper about this, repeatedly refers to Hannibal Lecter, and he says Hannibal Lecter is from an asylum. He's crazy. And, and the references to try to establish for the people who listen to him that these countries are opening their asylums in order to come to the United States. Um, there's a play on words there for people who don't know the difference between the right of asylum, which is built into the law of the United States, and Hannibal Lecter, who came from a madhouse. Yeah. An asylum versus an asylum. And if you don't know better, you conflate the two. And I suggest to you there are people who actually buy that and do conflate the two. Asylum equals asylum. Thank you, Donald Trump, for helping us understand. And thank you, Gene Rosenfeld, for helping us understand in a much more profound way. We'll see you next time soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Aloha. Mm -hmm.